everyone, welcome back to 996 The Howl. Uh, we're going to go a bit deeper on the Christian Dvorak trade. One of my favorite Coyotes players and uh, probably one of the biggest you'll find on YouTube. So I guess I have to talk him up a bit more, you know, tell the Montreal Canadian fans who they're getting and what to expect. Now I just want to preface this with Saturday morning where someone left a comment on an older video about a couple months old and uh, the commenter's username was Charles and it said, uh, I didn't think this offseason could get any worse. And that was Saturday morning. And when I read that Saturday morning, I laughed. I'm like, imagine the offseason did get worse. And then hours later, it did get worse. So if you want to blame someone, if you're an Arizona Coyotes fan who's upset and frustrated, uh, it's Charles' fault. So go find him and lambast him. So let's get into Dvorak. If you see, if you notice, hey, there's no 2018-2019 season up there. He was out for five months with a torn pectoral injury uh, into training camp and missed the first five months. He came back, played about 20 games uh, when they had a, you know, a, a late playoff push in 2019 where they lost all the playoffs by four points to the Avalanche, who then beat Calgary and then lost in the second round to San Jose. So it seems like a very long time ago, but it was only 2019. So let's get into it. Uh, but a you know, couple miscellaneous stats that I found interesting with Dvorak. But we'll start you know, with his stats. Rookie season, phenomenal for a rookie. For a second round pick rookie who wasn't really flashy, getting 15 goals, 18 assists, 33 points. Pretty darn good. This was under Dave Tippett, like I mentioned in the previous video. Just starting out, feeling out the league. And near the end of the season, Dave Tippett started to throw Dvorak. Uh, once they trade away Martin Hansel, Dvorak took over first-line center duties. Face-offs were a bit weak, but he only got better as he grew. The next season, same amount of goals, 15, and then 22 assists, 37 points. So you could look to him as like a, a mid-30s to a 40-point player. He'll hit 20 goals, but I think he'll stay in the range of 20 to 25. In 2019-2020, uh, he played half the season with Taylor Hall and got 18 goals, 20 assists, 38 points. His, his best uh, face-off numbers to date, over 55%. Those are great face-off numbers. Like I said, he played with Taylor Hall. I don't think it was optimized well. I don't think he played well with Taylor Hall. He was literally always passing and trying to find Taylor Hall. I feel like, you know, Hall really wrecked the mojo of the team. The team was first place in the Pacific when they acquired Taylor Hall. And then from then on, uh, Darcy Kemper got injured and then, um, yeah, fell out of the playoff spot, managed to get into play-ins due to the pandemic and you know here we are we all know this story but yes he didn't really play well with Hall Hall always demanded the puck maybe Dvorak you know felt like hey it's Taylor Hall might as well give him the puck he's better than me so uh you know in 2021 most he was mostly playing first line center duties not playing with Taylor Hall playing with you know Coyote core players Clayton Keller most of the time uh, put up around the same amount of numbers. It was a shortened season. Remember that. This is 56 games. That's 70 games. So 17 goals, 14 assists, 31 points. On pace, both of these for about, you know, over 20 goals. But I do not think he'll reach over 25 goals. He's not an offensive dynamo. Uh, he, he's a respectable two-way centerman. Very responsible. Um, takes critical play, uh, face-offs. You know, near the end of the game, maybe in the defensive zone, they need to win a face-off. You know, they're up one goal, and, you know, they need to win a face-off and get the puck out of their end. That's Dvorak. In the playoffs, this includes the play-ins. Two goals, one assist, three points, and nine playoff games. I'm sure the Montreal Canadiens, you know, want to know if he'll produce in the playoffs because they're hoping to make the playoffs again after their deep run last season. Um, I mentioned the face-offs, you know, three seasons straight over 50%. Comparable to Deneau, who had six straight seasons of over 50% on the faceoffs. Yes, Dvorak's rookie season faceoff numbers weren't great at all, but, you know, he's a rookie. So he's just getting used to the league and how faceoffs work and facing elite competition. 
But, uh, you know, later he's progressed really well. He's facing the top line all the time, the opposing team's top line. So it's good that he's over 50% in the face sauce. Moving on to shot percentage. I found this to be crazy. And it makes sense. Um, he's, his shooting percentage is really high. 17% in his rookie season. 10%, which is normal. Most players have about, you know, high single digits to so about 10 to 12%. Um, 2019, 2020, 13 and a half percent. And then last season, 18% shooting percentage, shooting way above average. And that's the type of player he is. He always looks to pass, even though he has a lethal shot. Um, being a huge Dvorak fan, he has a great shot, but doesn't use it as much. He loves to pick corners. He loves shooting high glove on goalies. Um, even when um, some of these players, when they're skating down the wing, they'll try and catch the goalie off guard by shooting it over the goalie's shoulder closest to the post. He likes to do that trick shot. Sometimes it works. Most of the time it doesn't. Um, he's also great on the shootouts. He went four for four last season. So four attempts, four goals, 100% on the shootouts last season. And last season he had five multi-goal games. So just imagine that in five games, he got 10 out of his 17 goals, which is crazy and maybe a bit alarming. You know, some Montreal fans might look at his goal scoring numbers and say, he'll just get 25 easy. But, you know, he only scored three goals last season against teams that weren't California or St. Louis. Um, so that's Colorado, Vegas, and Minnesota. He only scored three goals against those three teams. The Cowboys usually lost miserably against those three teams. So when they faced deep competition, Dvorak really didn't show up. Most of his goals were against California teams, a lot against Anaheim. You know, so maybe, you know, I want to mention that. No one's really going to talk about that unless you watch Coyotes games. But that's why I'm saying don't take his 17 goals in 56 games and say he'll get 25 easy next season. A lot of those goals, a bulk of those goals were against really weak California teams. And some St. Louis, you know, Cali Coyotes had, had good fortune against St. Louis. Not even fortune, they played well against St. Louis. They won their season series against St. Louis. But those other three elite teams, embarrassing games, the Rock didn't show up, top players didn't show up. Maybe that's a team thing. But, uh, yeah, if you're looking for Dvorak for pure offense, you're kind of mis misguided in that sense. Um, his time on ice has only increased as he's been in the NHL. You know, coaches are more comfortable with him on the ice. They trust him more. So he's a good trusting player. Um, his penalty kill time on ice, a bit strange in 2019-2020, I found, but I guess... Rick Tockett loved to play Stepan, Soderberg, and Richardson instead of Dvorak. But last season, a minute and 54 seconds on penalty kill time. So, pure penalty killer, our top penalty killer after Brad Richardson and Derek Stepan left the team. He was held with the duties on the first pair. Um, before moving on to the Coyote side, I want to say that he's comparable to Dano, but he'll score more than Dano. I actually didn't even look up Deneau's numbers, but apparently his career high is only 13 goals, which he's done twice. So yes, I would agree with Montreal fans saying that Dvorak has more offensive upside than Deneau. Don't expect too much more. He's not a flashy guy at all. He's not a Max Domi. Um, so get, you know, maybe fix your mirrors a bit when you're thinking about Dvorak. But yes, a good face-off guy, defensive two-way forward, Great penalty killer. So you're looking at a Dano who could also score and maybe has a better shot than Dano. I never watched Dano really. Only in the playoffs, I've watched Montreal games and Dano didn't score at all in the playoffs. So I'm sure Dvorak would have scored a bit more. Um, I think Dvorak will fit Montreal system really well from my experience with Montreal games, which is only the playoffs. Stingy, defensive heavy, capitalize on their opportunities type team. They weren't a, you know, pedal to the metal, high flying offensive team. They, you know, they, they stayed packed, played good defense, amazing goaltending, capitalized when they could have. And Dvorak is that player. He's not a high flying guy, not a, you know, take the leash off him and he'll just fly. He's very responsible, 
always thinking about the defensive end first. He'll be good on the back check. And uh, he gets into the corners a little bit. Maybe he could improve on that. He, he could go to the front of the net a little bit more. On the power play, he'll, he will be the guy in front of the net. So I'm sure Josh Anderson is another guy like Montreal on Montreal who's like that too. So expect him to go in the front of the net on the power play. He does play power play minutes, usually on the first line because the Coyotes, you know, who else do they have? Uh, that's a joke. So on the Coyotes side, they get another first round pick. It is top 10 protected, meaning if either of the Montreal or Carolina picks are in the top 10, it will be deferred to the other pick that is not top 10. My hot take is Montreal misses the playoffs. Uh, I think the Atlantic division just got even tougher. I think Tampa and Boston are elite hockey teams. I think Toronto is an elite regular season team. And Florida improved way too much in the offseason to miss the playoffs. And then if you're battling for the wild card, the Metro is like one of the best divisions in the league. So I don't even know who you bump out from the Metro. I mean, Washington, Philadelphia, the Islanders, like you can't even count out any of those teams. Columbus, yes, they'll miss, miss the playoffs. My other hot take is Carolina. I don't think Carolina... You know, they'll probably make the playoffs, but just a little, like, a wild card position. They downgraded their goaltending way too much. Their forward core is amazing. You know, an elite forward grouping. Defense is, is young and underrated. I agree with that. But I do not trust Antti Ranta and uh, Anderson at all. I almost called him Craig Anderson. It's Frederick Anderson. I don't trust him at all. Injury-prone goalies. I like Anderson. A lot of Leafs don't. I don't think he'll get injured as often, but Auntie Ranta is going to be injured. Um, you can quote me on this, record it, timestamp it. There's no way Auntie Ranta goes into the season without getting injured. This guy was getting injured sitting on the bench, literally sitting in the press box. He would mid game, they'd announce he has a lower body injury, and I'm not joking. Uh, he's very injury prone. Um, this is his last stop in the NHL. I, there's no way he goes a season healthy. If he does, that's some Coyotes black magic that we can't even define in this realm. So, uh, yes, they got another first-round pick. They have three first-round picks. The Coyotes do five second-round picks next draft. That's not a joke. So that gives them some flexibility. Maybe they'll trade up in the draft. You know, trade a team two second-round picks for their low first-round pick. So whoever finishes, like, 29th, 30, maybe 31, the Cowboys could go, hey, we'll give you two second rounders for your first. It's a very deep draft. The Cowboys have revamped their scouting department with elite talent around the league. Bill Armstrong is focusing on drafting well, so this is all lining up for their plan, and that's the plan they're going towards. Cap space, $12 million, and that's including all the cap dumps. That's including Strawman, Andrew Ladd, the three Vancouver anchors. Um, that is a lot of cap space. Maybe they could do another cap dump and get another high pick, or maybe they just sit on that money, use it for something else. Uh, maybe acquire a young, cheap guy who's going to grow. Um, they have a lot of cap space for that. Uh, maybe they just save it for the off season. High, you know, maybe they want to accelerate the retool depending on how good their draft goes and get a good free agent. But it's good flexibility that it ha to have. Um, I also want to say that I applaud the trade. It sucks to see Dvorak go, but Bill Armstrong said that he wanted a first-round pick for Dvorak. He wasn't getting it at the draft, and Bill Armstrong said, I wasn't going to trade him unless I got a first, and he didn't. A lot of teams were asking about Dvorak, and he held tight, saying, nope, this is his value. I expect this. And then the Carolina offer sheet happens, and luck happens, and someone offers him a first. You can't say no to a first-round pick for Christian Dvorak, who is a hot at the ceiling. He's a high second-line centerman. If Montreal plays him third-line center and has Suzuki and Drouin as their top two, uh, he will excel. He'll play over his expectations third-line center. He could handle second-line center duties as well, but uh, first-line center, I don't think so. And I'm, I don't think Montreal's going to play him first line center. They have Suzuki and maybe Duran, whoever they feel more comfortable with. But I feel like the Brock will fit Montreal's system well. That responsible, tight checking, you know, 
responsible type player that Dominic Ducharme decided to go with in the playoffs. You know, he was hesitant on playing some of his young players in the playoffs. Uh, he won't be hesitant to play Dvorak. So expect him to get a lot of ice time. And I'm sure he'll fall, the, the coach will fall in love with him. As for the fans, he's very emotionless. Very standard hockey answers towards the media. But apparently in the locker room, he's very funny. He's a locker room favorite. We always used to hear journalists and beat writers for the Coyotes say all the teammates love Dvorak. But as a fan, you really don't see it. He's very icy, you know, ice through his veins. Even when he scores, he, sh he doesn't smile. But apparently in the locker room, he's a good guy. So I hope all the best for Dvorak. And that's not my, I have nothing else to say. So that's it. I hope that's a good deep dive. Um, it sucks to see him go. But that's just the name of the game when you're doing a rebuild and a proper teardown. Um, three first-round picks and one of the best drafts in a decade. It's a good plan. And so we'll see where it goes. So thank you for watching. If you like what you see, spread the word. And as always, thank you for your support.